They must accept the $1,000 dividend, less revenue and progressivity from the broad-based tax, and limited oil and gas tax reform with repayment of some of the outstanding credits. The Senate majority and those aligned with it get the Senate's version of SB 26, the permanent fund bill, and HB 111, the oil and gas tax bill, and are able to make larger payments to the oil and gas industry to pay off tax credits, but have to concede a modest broad-based tax structure and restore the operating budget reductions. And the state gets a level of fiscal stability, avoid shutdown, and, uh, but must continue to significantly uh, sh show significant restraint in spending uh, because to stay within available revenues. And that's the compromise that we brought to the, brought to the various uh, bodies. <clears throat> Thank you. Commissioner, a couple further comments and we want to open it up to, to questions. Um, you know, it's not unusual in compromise that the, when the parties first look at a compromise, they say they really what the, jumps off the page is, is what they lost, not necessarily what stayed of on, of, on the compromise of, of what was important to them. So I've done that myself in the past, certainly, and, and so that's not <coughs> unusual. It's not inappropriate, and, and that certainly we have seen that uh, in, the, in the case since we, we presented that. But I think we need to focus on what, uh, not on what uh, people gave up, but what they were able to, to retain in this, in this compromise. You know, sometimes it's necessary to find the courage to temper our own passion to allow the convictions of others to play a role in the compromise itself. But the fact remains we're running out of time. Uh, you know, we must not let perfect be the enemy of good in this process. While it, <clears throat> it may not be a perfect compromise, it's the only compromise that's on the table. I, I would welcome I would welcome dueling compromises. I would welcome other compromising, um, compromises coming forth. I submitted a compromise because I didn't see one. And I think compromise is, is the key to resolving the situation that, that we're in today. It's the, it's the key to resolving the, um, the fiscal uh, crisis that we're in. It's also compromise is key to making sure we don't have um, government services shut down on, on July 1st. So my message to legislators, if you can't <clears throat> find further compromise in what I have presented, please, please develop your own compromise. But most of all, make sure it's a balance and that Alaskans are not deprived of the much needed government services that they will need as of July 1 of this year. We don't have to be like Washington, D.C. We don't have to go into a, a gridlock shutdown uh, mode. We really don't. You know, we're, we're Alaskans. We're Alaskans first. We all are. All 60 people in this building are Alaskans first, politicians second. There's no question in my mind about that. So that's how we need to come together as Alaskans, to reach this compromise. Whether it's mine, I don't, I don't say it's got to be my compromise. We need, to, we need to resolve the problem. And now, I, I've, I've said this before, I'm going to say it again. We, we, we need to be not focus on the next election. We need to be focused on the next generation. And that's what the focus in this, this building needs to be. To the public, I say, please let your legislator know it's okay to compromise. I know I've heard from, from some that have said I've, I've given up on some things that I have I've said I would stand for. That's what, that's what compromise looks like. In fact, most Alaskans across the state are asking for compromise, and I think that's what they, I think that's what they deserve. And to also pass a fully funded budget uh, before July 1. You know, we've always been, as Alaskans, best when we're, when we're facing challenges. Earlier this week, I had a chance, actually yet, uh, yesterday, uh, Sunday, I had a chance to participate in Alaska in a ceremony honoring those uh, in the Aleut community that uh, were, uh, as a re result of World War II, were, went to, were taken to internment camps and to meet those individuals. And I met many of them uh, that had personally had, had lived out that experience. And boy, the resilience of, the, of that, uh, you know, they, you know, we sometimes look back at, at um, you know, reach back to the earthquake or a flood in Fairbank. But boy, go back to World War II when, when people were, were, were taken from their home, from their villages, and, and taken to an unknown, and, and taken to Southeast. And when they went back, many of their homes were not in the condition they left them in. And so I, I look at what Alaska has done at times of, of need. And we're in a time of need. We're in a time of, we're in a time of crisis. You know, there's no question about it. When we're facing, you know, 20 some days, we shut down government, that's a crisis. When we're drawing down $10 billion, you know, from savings, that's a crisis. And, and those that, uh, that don't uh, believe that is that we're in a crisis, I, I, don't live in their, I don't live in their world. So now, we, as, you know, as we, as we look at how we're going to do this, we're going to do this together. We're going to do this as Alaskans, and we're going to do it through compromise. 
And that's how we're going to fix this, uh, this issue, and that's how it can be fixed. There's plenty of time to fix it between now and, and the end of this, uh, this special session. So with that, I want to open it up for questions. Becky. Becky Hill with the Associated Press. Um, Governor, you, you mentioned the, the passion of those who spoke against your compromise, and the reason you introduced the compromise is because you said on Friday that negotiations had reached a stalemate. So if you're getting this reaction um, now, um, what level of confidence do you have if they couldn't reach compromise before that they'll be able to do that now? And what, um, what do you see your ongoing role in this process as? Well, a couple things. One is, I, you know, for every action, there's a reaction. Uh, there's no question about that. And so I, I expect that, and that's, that's appropriate. But uh, what I can't stand for is inaction. So I'll take the reaction. I'll take the, the brunt of what comes my way as a result of my actions. I've been doing that since I got sworn in as governor. I've done some things that I've had a lot of reaction from. And I'll take that because no, no decision I make that I don't believe is in the best interest of Alaska. So the reaction is, is, is expected. It's appropriate. I don't fault anybody for reacting to a, to a compromise plan that is different than what they'd hoped that it would be. But I will continue to stay involved and engage in the process to the maximum extent possible. Liz. Uh, Liz Raines with KTDA. To, so to follow up on that, since the House majority has rejected the compromise plan, will you uh, work to perhaps rearrange the pieces and put out a new one? Or where do you go from here? You know, I think, I think the main thing is we continue to talk to each other. I think if we're talking to each other, I think that, that that's progress. There's something now on the table. There's a compromise uh, plan on the uh, on the table. Maybe maybe somebody else will bring a different plan in, a different compromise in. So, of course, I'll continue to uh, to work with the uh, with with the House and with the Senate. And as I said, nobody has nobody has endorsed this uh, this compromise, and I guess that's a sign of a you know of a true compromise. If nobody's really really happy with it, then maybe it's getting close to it. And, and I saying this is the absolute final. You know, they could change it. That's not, not my. You know, I put something on the table. So if they want to take it and do something with it, work with the Senate. They want to do their own. That that's wonderful. But we have to. We have to. There has to. We know one thing for sure, Liz. We have to have compromise in order in order to uh, resolve the situation we're in. And there will be compromise. I'm I'm actually concerned about that. Steve. Uh, Steve, with Woodward, Governor. Um, why did you choose not to introduce your own broad-based tax at some point? You know, I, I felt that to, at this late date to bring in something new rather than something that's already in the hopper, already in the process, would, would be um, a bit disruptive. And, and time is, is not our friend, as I've said many times today. So I felt using one that uh, already was there, um, quite honestly, it was, it, was, it was one that was, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't if I had drafted it, wouldn't it be that's not the way it would be. But but uh, that's the one that the one that we used, and so we thought it was appropriate to use one of their their bills rather than introduce something new from ourselves. Andrew, Andrew Kitchman, Alaska Public Radio Network. Governor uh, Speaker Edgman yesterday described the deficit uh, under the compromise as uh, we're still going to have a tremendous deficit. Um, what is your reaction to that, and what's your thoughts about the deficit that's included in the conference? Well, I again, I, I appreciate his sensitivity to the deficit. I, I really do, and he's spoken many times, uh, very passionately about about the full fiscal plan, so that we are in control of our of our our destiny financially. And I, I certainly applaud him for that. This doesn't close doesn't close it up completely. It, it doesn't. There, there, there most likely will need to be some additional adjustments in the in the future years. But remember, we've we've come down from. You know, about a $3.7 billion deficit down to this will leave potentially about a $300 million uh, gap. So I, I sometimes look at the, the yardage we've made, and yes, we're not completely across the finish line. Um, I've always wanted to stand here and say we have done that, uh, but it's going to take a little bit longer. So I, 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 I appreciate his comments. I appreciate his, uh, his vision. I really do. And if somehow in the compromise that can work, that would be, that would be wonderful. But, but right now, it's, there, there is a bit of a gap that's still left. Austin. Governor, uh, everyone keeps saying that nobody wants to see a government shut down, but it sure seems more and more to me like one or more of the legislative majorities, one or, one or more of the entities with power in this building would be perfectly fine with the shutdown. Uh, and, and I guess I wonder, does it seem like the game at this point is push it to the very end or push it kind of beyond and into a shutdown on the belief or the premise that somehow that will make somebody flip. You know, I, one thing, the only thing I can say with assurance, I don't think anybody in this building is perfectly fine with a shutdown. 
I think that Speaker Edgman said it well in one of his press availabilities at the, his closing comments on that of a few weeks ago, um, how um, th that, is not a, that is not a goal, that is not a, a desire, and so I don't think anybody would be happy with a shutdown. Now, your question about do we get to the very end and deals are made at the very end, I think sometimes that's the way things happen uh, in, this, in this process when not. So I hope we don't get to the very end deadline to make those deals, but um, uh, we'll continue to work um, around the clock to, uh, to do what we can to, to make sure that doesn't happen. It's, it's kind of at 141 days of nothing, and that's where, I mean, like... <clears throat> you know, I'm sorry, I don't mean to interrupt you. No, no, please. You know, I, I, I would push back on that. I, I wouldn't say it's 141 days of, of nothing at all. I mean, they have made some major steps. I mean, as I said earlier, because of the House's decision, because of the steps they took, they presented a full fiscal plan. That just never happened before. So, so I don't I don't forget those things. And so, uh, they have worked hard. They have moved the ball significantly. It's not where it needs to be right now. To, to I, I believe, and certainly not. In, we need we need a budget. But but they, they they've 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 definitely made progress. There's no question about that. James, James Brooks from the Juno Empire, uh, Governor. Two years ago, by this time, we had seen at least the outline of a plan for a shutdown. What the state would be doing. What services would be offered. Can you talk a bit about where you are in drafting that plan for the shutdown? I can't, uh, and I might ask uh, Pat Pitney to join me here a bit. You know, we did this in, in 2015. 2015 was a little bit different because it was a partial shutdown, because of potential, because it was a partial budget. So we kind of looked at it was a, it was a, a different exercise. Having gone through that in 2015, we, we sort of used that as a little bit of a template for what we're doing. So we're in the process of of gathering that now to try to uh, put out as far as to give as much notice as possible to the public of what they they might expect. Um, we hopefully it doesn't doesn't take place. We're not trying to scare anybody. We're not trying to uh, put pressure on anybody in this building. Uh, we're just trying to do our job, and our job is that we have an obligation, a contractual obligation, to give notices to those under a collective bargain agreement. We did that on June 1st, and now it's the the businesses, the you know those that that uh, out there that that depend upon the services for uh, what we provide. And so, Pat, do you want to speak to that at all, or does that answer your question, James? <coughs> There's a lot of services coming up here even before that July 1st, July 3rd deadline that are impacted. I'm thinking specifically for Juno. The ferry system, I mean, if the ferry system closes down, I mean, in the middle of tourist season, let alone everyone else who lives here. It would be widespread across the state. Uh, certainly it would be impacted significantly in southeast with the, with the last Green Highway system. No question about that. People, you know, uh, commerce that uh, is dependent upon that. People are dependent upon that for medical services. You know, for, for, for you know, for, you know, tourism, people plan their trips years in advance based upon that, on that schedule. So, um, it, it just, I mean, it, as I read the, 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 some of the draft material that comes across my desk as far as it is, it is extremely widespread. Registration of cars, selling houses, marriage certificate, death certificates, I mean, all sorts of things that, that uh, you would, um, that we take for granted. I mean, I mean, I think we don't realize sometimes all we take for granted until suddenly we look at those services not going to be available. Commercial fishing would be, would be significantly impacted, no question about that. Wide load permits for, for the trucking. I mean, it just, you know, it goes on and on, so. Last question. Gary Shea, KTOL. Um, a couple of years ago, when we were in this situation, the, the idea had come about third party arbitration. Um, it was kind of out of the box. Has anything like that come up at all this year? Is there any yeah. out of the box ways of resolving this, or is it all? within this building. Yeah, I think that was a sort of a different situation then. I mean, history doesn't exactly repeat itself, and so we have we sort of looked at that, and, and this isn't, this I don't think this is, a, that would be appropriate uh, at this at this juncture. I think that the the parties themselves are, are aligned in wanting to get uh, get these issues resolved, quite how to do that. So I, I'm not sure that arbitration was, um, um, would be appropriate in this, this particular incident. And last question, Liz. Thanks, Governor. I wanted to ask, so Kalis Energy has said that it won't be moving forward with its big Smith Bay project, and it points to vetoed oil tax credits last year and the lack of certainty surrounding oil tax legislation this year. Does that influence your position on payment of those oil tax credits or the tax legislation that's being um, debated right now, House Bill 111? You know, it really doesn't. <clears throat> I'm really following through with what I said initially. And you know, initially, uh, some years ago, we, we had the entire amount in our budget to pay them off in its entirety with the full fiscal plan. So now, as we've moved closer to that, then I, I'm considering that. So it's not based upon individual project. It's really based upon the, the overall economy of the state. So thank you very much. Anybody online?
Yep. Okay. Thanks very much. Thank you.